After the annexation of Lagos and the whole of Yoruba land, the British proceeded to dominate all of present-day southern Nigeria. Following the Berlin Conference of 1884 and 1885, Britain would lay claim to this region while expanding its influence. However, it wouldn't be a walk in the park, as the colonialists were met with fierce opposition from several prominent rulers in the area, especially in the Niger Delta region. This opposition would lead to the deposition, removal and banishment of these rulers from their kingdoms. Chief among these rulers were King Jaja of Okobo and Governor Nana Olomu of the Benin River. Born around 1821 in Amaibo village, in the Orlu district of Igbo land, Jubo Jubogba, a name given to him by his master, would go on to rise from penury and slavery into affluence, wealth and extraordinary leadership. He later became known as Jaja of Okobo. As a slave boy in the house of the king of Boni, Jaja proved to be highly resourceful discharging his duties with a tremendous amount of effectiveness and enthusiasm. Following the death of Chief Alali, Jaja was elected head of the Opopo Ani Pebble Trading House. As an astute businessman, he would go on to expand the influence of the trading house and increase operations in the hinterland. In 1868, a rival trading house led by Chief Oko Jumbo attacked his trading post. Instead of resorting to war, Jaja would relocate his traded house to a new settlement, which he named Okobo. Thus, he became independent of Boni. Within a few years, he expeditiously drew the palm oil trade from Boni as he served as a middleman between the European merchants and the produce sellers in the interior. One of the ways by which the British sought to take over these lands was by the signage of treaties promising the protection of these lands. A notable treaty which Jaja signed was that of 1873. This treaty would see Jaja become recognized as king of Okobo by the British. It also stipulated that no European trading establishments would be permitted in Okobo and that Okobo River would be closed to traders above a certain point. In 1881, Jaja's troubles with the British merchants began. George Watts had opened his factory in Kwa Iboe, a suburb within Jaja's jurisdiction. As a result, Jaja led two disciplinary expeditions to the region on April 11, 1881 and May 16, 1881, respectively. He claimed sovereignty over the Kwa Iboe River and its people. Consul Hewitt, who had the mission of signing treaties, would warn Jaja off stating that the Kwaibo River and its people were under the protection of the British. This would lead to a disagreement which continued until 1884. Another worrying issue that broke out between Jaja and the British was the signage of the Protectorate Treaty. At the time, the trade depression in England from the 1880s spurred the British traders into assuming that their profits would increase if they could thwart Jaja's middleman's role in the eastern Niger Delta. In order to achieve this goal, they sought the assistance of the British Consul. The British Consul met with great opposition from Jaja and his chiefs, especially regarding a particular clause in the treaty that would have allowed for free trade by the British in every part of the territory. Jaja vehemently refused to sign the treaty until the clause was struck out and after a reassurance that the Queen was not interested in Jaja's country and markets. In addition, the European traders in 1885 requested a reduction in the price of palm oil due to the drop in the world price. However, Jaja refused to heed their request. One of the British firms, Alexander Miller Brother & Company, would break out from the African Association, an amalgamation of British trading firms, and join forces with Jaja. This defection triggered fierce commercial rivalries among British firms. 
These other firms and the Foreign Council considered that Dajjal's attitude might make the exercise of the British protectorate difficult unless he was dealt with. This stance was also shared by Vice Consul Harry Johnston, who felt that the most effective way to support commerce in the area would be the humiliation or banishment of Jaja. On September 19, 1887, Harry Johnston invited King Jaja of Okobo aboard a naval vessel. He assured Jaja that he would be free to leave whenever he wanted to. However, this was not the case. While aboard the ship, Jaja was given two options. He either granted access to the Europeans to trade or risk bombardment and exile. Jaja refused to back down and he was arrested and deposed for obstructing British commercial and political expansion. His trial, which took place in the Gold Coast, present-day Ghana, was slated for November 29, 1887. He was accused of terrorism, administering illegal oaths to natives, apparently to frighten them from dealing directly with European agents, obstructing trade to the inland districts beyond his jurisdiction, and blocking the highway and waterways entrance into Okobo River, thereby flouting the terms and spirit of the Berlin Treaty of 1884 and 1885. On December 1, 1887, Sir Walter Huntgrub found Jaja guilty and he was exiled to the West Indies. Jaja would eventually go on to campaign for his freedom. He appealed against the order through the assistance of Major MacDonald, a British officer who felt that Jaja had been treated unjustly. In May 1888, Jaja was moved to the island of St. Vicente, Cape Verde. His health began to deteriorate and the foreign office decided to move him to Barbados. There, the people of Barbados, having heard of the capture of an African king, felt insulted that he had been subjected to such ridicule and shame. He was welcomed with a loud ovation. The British, afraid that they might hatch an escape plan, sailed back to St. Vicente. After years of appealing against his detention, Jaja eventually won the appeal and the order was revoked by the British Parliament. His health further deteriorated and it was agreed by the Parliament that he should be sent back to his hometown of Okobo. Unfortunately, he would not make the journey home. He was sent first to Santa Cruz, Tenerife, to await the arrival of Major MacDonald. On the morning of July 8, 1891, four years after his unjust detention, King Jaja of Okobo died. He was 70. The land of Okobo would rapidly come into ruins after his death as it became plagued with slave raids and exploitation of its resources by the British. Nana Olomu, the governor of the Benin River, was another prominent ruler to be deposed and exiled by the British. One of the 106 children of Olomu, Nana was born into nobility, affluence and stupendous wealth around the year 1852 at Jakba in the Itshekiri region. The Itshekiri served as middlemen in the palm oil trade between the Urobos and the European merchants. Nana Olumu's father would go on to establish his own village, Ebrohimi, on the Benin River. Nana Olumu grew up under the influence of his grandmother and he displayed distinguishing qualities of genius, character and enterprise. His father, having noticed these qualities, would draft him into war and Nana helped his father in many wars. The senior Olumu made his son the commander general during the Eku War of 1872. He continued in this position until the death of his father in 1883. Following the death of his father, Nana Olomo would take on the mantle of leadership in 1884 without opposition from any of his peers in the land. Due to his effective control of the trade of palm oil, he was able to build his kingdom and greatly develop the capital of Ebrahimi. In 1885, he was installed into the consul area by Her Majesty and was presented with a staff of office sent by the Queen. Mm -hmm. 
Nana Olomo, like Jaja of Okbobo, signed treaties with the British government, but also struck out clauses that would have allowed the British access to free trade within his kingdom. These uncooperative tendencies would serve as a precursor to the Ebrohimi expedition of 1894. In 1891, following the creation of the Oil River Protectorate, Nana's position as governor, according to the British, became unnecessary. The protectorate was created to impose direct British rule on the natives and depose African chiefs in the area, including Nana Olomu. Before the creation of the protectorate, Nana had a collision with the proud British consul, George Annesley, who broke Nana's staff of office and threw one half of it into the river because, according to him, he had been in the Benin River for seven days and was ignored by Nana. Tension had begun to rise and tempers would eventually set off the Ebrohimi expedition of 1894. Nana, fully aware of the harsh treatment suffered by Jaja of Okobo in the hands of the British, refused to attend any of the meetings to which he was invited, especially by Ralph Moore, the new commissioner for the All River Protectorate. He vehemently refused to attend any of the meetings. Instead, he would send representatives on his behalf. Due to Nana's resistance to the British government's role in the exploitation of the Niger Delta area, the British laid siege to his town. He had an impressive military machine, enormous wealth and great influence, all of which combined proved to be vital components in his monopoly of the palm oil trade. The resistance put up by Nana against the British in 1894 was daring and remarkably brilliant. The British, having no knowledge of the creeks which they had to sail to reach Ebrohimi and the military prowess which Nana possessed, thought the expedition was going to be a casual military one. The expedition would turn out to be one of their most difficult and costly imperial adventures in West Africa. In fact, they put up one of the best British forces ever up until that time. The crisis worsened and all attempts to capture Ebrohimi by the British failed. Nana had such an impenetrable military force that on three occasions, he impelled the British forces to withdraw with heavy casualties. However, on September 25, 1894, Nana's capital of Ebrohimi eventually fell, mainly because Dobo, a local river of Nana, provided the British with logistic and intelligence support. The expedition would last for three months. After his defeat in 1894, the arms seized in Ebrohimi included 106 cannons, 445 blooder buses, 640 guns, and 10 revolvers, in addition to 1,640 kegs of gunpowder and 2,500 rounds of machine gun ammunition. Ralph Moore issued a proclamation declaring Nana an outlaw and placed a bounty of £500 sterling for his recapture. All his properties were confiscated and later sold. Proceeds from the sale were used to defray the cost of the expedition, marking the demise of Nana's trading empire. During the attack on the town, Nana and many of his followers escaped through a secret canal at the back of the town and dispersed his family in different escape directions. Nana himself escaped to Lagos, outsmarting the invading British force who found his abandoned canoe on the morning of September 28, 1894, only to meet Nana's papers and documents in the canoe. While in Lagos, Nana stayed in the house of his long-term Yoruba friend, Seidu Olowu, who would temporarily harbor Nana and his followers. He also wrote a petition of clemency to the governor of Lagos Colony, Sir Gilbert Carter, on behalf of Nana. While at Olowu's place, Nana got in touch with his bosom friend from England, George Neville. Nana surrendered voluntarily to Carter on October 30. However, the governor had no legal right to detain the chief. Hence, he handed Nana over to the British consular court. Nana's trial began on November 30 and he was charged with and wrongfully accused of obstructing trade, terrorizing the Urubo, waging war against Her Majesty and engaging in inhumane slave trafficking. However, 
Nana Olomo's real offense was that his wealth, position, and power gave him considerable influence over the Benin River and the Wari district, making penetration of the Benin traders difficult, if not impossible. His trial, which took place at the consular court in Old Calabar, had an unfair proceeding as Nana had no legal defense nor did he have any witnesses. Meanwhile, the British had seven witnesses who testified against Nana. On December 6, Nana Olomu was found guilty by the court presided over by Sir Cloud MacDonald. He was detained in Old Calabar for two years. The Ichekiri chief was later deported and exiled to Accra, Gold Coast, present-day Ghana for life. While in Accra, Nana Olomu never allowed his circumstances to affect him. Together with his friend, George Neville, they wrote petitions for clemency for his release. Nana moved on with life in Accra and even had three children with his wife, Mami, whom he took with him to exile. After 10 years in exile, Nana would eventually be pardoned and released to return home. There was wild jubilation in the lands of Ichekiwi and some clans in Urubu, like Agbaro, Agbon and Efron. A throng of the crowd welcomed him as he returned home on August 8, 1906. Chief Nana Olomu settled in New America, now known as Koko. A year later, together with his craftsmen, sons, relatives and followers, he began the construction of his residence. This residence would become the famous Nana's Palace. In 1910, three years later, Nana completed his palace. It became a national monument in 1979, but was officially declared as such by the National Commission for Museum and Monuments on September 2, 1990. In 1916, Nana Olumu died and was survived by his over 60 children. He was 64. Of all his contemporaries who were banished by the British, Nana Olomu was the only one who returned home and died peacefully. However, one prominent ruler in Benin, Oba Ovoramwen, Nubaisi, was not so lucky as the British invaded and looted his kingdom while he was sent into exile to Calabar where he died in 1914. You can know more about the deposition of Oba Ovo Ramwen and the British invasion of Benin in our next episode.